All right, so just to review what we talked about last week, we were kind of talking about the, the different kinds of memories. Um, uh, you know, we, we drew this picture, and we kind of thought about it in terms of speed of these memories, but we still want to think about as memory is, is, is serving a purpose. Anything that is a type of memory holds values. Now, the way they hold those values might be different. Uh, the duration in which they hold the values might be different. So, for instance, when we deal with memory at the system memory or the register and the cache memory level, you know, this is dealing with uh, uh, what's called volatile memory. Um, so here, let me go ahead and throw that into a slide here somewhere. So we have volatile versus non-volatile memory. Uh, do you know what volatile memory is? What does that mean for memory to be volatile memory? Guesses? It, uh, doesn't that mean it like gets erased when a computer restarts? Yeah, so volatile memory. Is maintained by constant electrical charge. By constant electrical charge. Was that just another word for RAM? Well, it's it's RAM plus cache plus register. So this point, this point, and faster are all volatile memory. Okay. Um, yeah. So you're. So the answer to your question is a sort of, but not directly. Uh, so uh, volatile memory is maintained by a constant electrical charge. So when you reboot your computer or turn your computer off, when you cut that electricity, you lose the data. All right, so that's volatile. Non-volatile, on the other hand, stores data in another way. This could be magnetically. Um, so if we go back to our older hard drives that used uh, magnetic disks, floppy disks were magnetic. Um, uh, DVDs and CDs, you would burn into them, so it would burn a pattern. Um, you know, well, yeah, it was kind of a melty thing. Um, solid state drives use uh, a flash type technology, which is, uh, um, it, it does have a physical uh, durability uh, related to it to the disk, but you know, in any case, um, you know, here I'll just I'll just kind of throw some stuff out here. Flash. Um, I'll just end it like that. That's fine. Um, data is not reliant on an electrical charge, and therefore sticks around. All right. And both of these have their advantages and disadvantages. Generally, we'll say volatile tends to be faster and more expensive per bit. I'm just doing it per bit because that's our atomic level for dealing with memory, right? Even though uh, practically bytes are kind of the lowest level we deal with them at. Um, these guys tends to be slower and less expensive per bit. You know, we can imagine that if you could buy a 32 gigabyte hard drive, it would be substantially less expensive than a 30, than 32 gigs of RAM. That was, there was a point in time with uh, solid state drives where that wasn't completely true. Um, but now it pretty much is true. You could get solid state drives in the, you know, uh, 300 gigabyte range pretty inexpensively now uh, for about the same price as 16 gigs of RAM or, or something, something like that. All right, so in any case, you know, the idea is that this stuff over here is non-volatile, this stuff over here is volatile and they both are types of memory. So when we abstract this stuff and we think about how do we manage memory, we might have a different approach for these different things. Uh, and part of that, well, actually, let me 
let's see if we can stumble upon this as we start talking about this. So um, when we talked about managing our volatile memory like our uh, RAM, we chose to uh, use 32-bit uh, memory addresses. Um, what was the purpose for us choosing a 32-bit memory address as opposed to a smaller memory address, 16 or an 8-bit size memory address? What, did the, what advantage did 32-bit memory addresses give us? Um, so let's see. What advantage did 32-bit mem addresses, mom addresses, give us for our RAM management. So for the homework that I guess technically was due Monday, but whatever, if you turned it in today, that's fine. Um, what, what advantage did us choosing to do this as 32 bits give us? Something we should definitely understand by now since we spent quite a bit of time working on that uh, uh, assignment and discussing the stuff in class. You know, we didn't just, convenience. We, we didn't just well, take that number out of the sky. <laughs> a larger um, address gives us more address space, which means we can potentially access more memory. Okay, so the bigger the memory address, the more individual addresses we can uniquely, we say address, but we can say talk about index, we can uniquely index, let's go with that. Uh, the more individual addresses we can uniquely index, index which means we can have more total memory. So a 32-bit memory address gives us 2 to the 32nd power. It gives us 4.294 um, billion uh, unique numbers. And even if we say that each bucket of memory is one byte, which actually isn't always true, but if we just say it's one byte, that means that we have um, 4.3 billion bytes of memory. So if I multiply, well, that's, that's by one, so this is one byte. So if we divide that by 1,024, that's kilobytes, divided by 1,024, that is uh, megabytes, divided by 1,024 is gigabytes. That means I can have four gigabytes of RAM in a system that is addressed in, with a one byte memory resolution where each bucket of memory can hold exactly one byte. That'll, we're gonna, when we talk about um, file systems today, you'll kind of see that how that decision, but do we decide, do we hold one byte? Do we hold two bytes? Do we hold four bytes? What's the minimum size of stuff we can hold in a single byte of RAM? The sim, or a single bucket, single bucket of RAM. Um, uh, and, uh, if you remember from the, uh, um, from modern day memory management from the 350 class, uh, most modern memory management systems use, uh, paging memory management, right? So the, uh, and what, what's the thing that a page fits in, in memory? So what do we, what do we call a bucket of memory in a paging memory management system? A page frame. Page frame. Yep. So we call it a frame. So a page fits in a frame, a frame has a size. Now, the reality is, is in most paging memory, memory algorithms, the frame size is not one byte. Frame size is typically like, could be four bytes, could be eight bytes. So at four bytes, we now support 16 gigs of RAM. Does that make sense? Uh, you know, be, instead, because we've effectively quadrupled the total number of indexes we have, because we're now indexing in four byte chunks instead of one byte chunk. So bucket zero is four bytes, bucket one is four bytes, bucket two is four bytes, so we get more total memory, 
All right, so that was the decision that we can make. So the 32-bit memory address says how many unique numbers do we have? We have two to the 32nd unique numbers. And then we say, well, how much memory does that support? The answer is, well, it depends. It supports that many unique buckets of memory times how big a bucket of memory is. So if we say, how much memory does this support? Generically, we say it supports two to the 32nd times number, well, times the size of a bucket of memory. So if size of bucket of memory, so for one byte memory resolution, this gives us four gigabytes. If we have four, four byte memory resolution, this gives us 16 gigabytes, so on and so forth. All right, that makes some sense. Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the idea by purposely picking um, a 32 bit number for a memory address. We could always pick larger values for a memory address, but then that has the other side effect of we have to, where do memory addresses get uh, stored when we're processing them? We're talking about storing stuff. Where do memory addresses get stored as we're processing them? We use them to address stuff in here, but we actually store them in places in here, right? So 32-bit maybe doesn't seem all that big, but now we're starting to deal with our larger registers and probably our rarer registers. I guess you can imagine as we keep going bigger and bigger, because we just say, well, why don't you just use a gigabit memory address? You know, if you have a gigabit memory address, man, you can have a lot of RAM. Even, <laughs> even at, uh, uh, so that would be two to the uh, uh, 1,024. Look, look, it, it didn't even give me a number. It just gave me a Wikipedia link. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. I don't know if I've ever seen that before. So two to the 32nd gives me a number. Two to the 64th gives me a number. Two to the 200th gives me a number. Two to the 600. <laughs> it doesn't want to do the math anymore. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so it would give me a lot of numbers, <laughs> a lot of unique memory addresses, which would translate into many, um, I'm sure, exabytes or whatever of, uh, of memory. But we can't just run wild and say, well, we want memory addresses to be gigantic because as we saw from the homework assignment, what do you think I was trying to show you uh, in the homework assignment that was due Monday? Can I have a quick question? Nope. Please? Nope. Oh my gosh, she's actually listening. <laughs> go, go ahead. <laughs> um like for the for the four byte resolution, how did you get the sixteen gigabyte? Just curious. Because yeah, well, I, I I don't I, know how you I calculate made it up, that. Right? So this is uh two to the thirty second times one, which gives me four point, what, two, nine, four billion. So then, you know, billion bytes, and that equals four gigabytes. That's what that number came out to. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I got the one byte, I just don't got the four byte. So two to the 32nd times four, so that's the number of unique buckets of memory is two to the 32nd times four, which is the size of a bucket of memory, gives me that. So then if I divide that by 1,024, that's kilobytes, 1,024, that's uh, megabytes, 1,024, that's gigabytes. So then I have a question. So then does two to the... 30 second have enough uh, like place to hold four byte memory resolutions like for the bucket wise. 
that's that has those two are disconnected. The two to the 32nd says this is how many unique numbers I can represent. I can represent 4.294 billion unique numbers. So that means I can address bucket zero of my uh, memory, bucket one of my memory, bucket two of my memory, bucket 4.294 bu billion in my memory. Now, so that's the number of buckets of memory I can uh, uh, address, but that doesn't tell me how much total memory I have. The no total memory I have is gonna be related to how big each of those buckets is. So in one byte resolution, each bucket is one byte, so I get four gigs of memory. But in four byte resolution, I'm gonna say each bucket actually holds four bytes of stuff. That has nothing to do with the two to the 32nd. I'm just using that number to say bucket zero, bucket one, bucket two, bucket 4.294, uh, uh, whatever, uh, billion. So if I'm using four bytes per bucket, then I get four times two to the 32nd, which is 16 gigs of total memory that I can actually address using four bytes per bucket. If I make it eight bytes per bucket, it, it, it keeps going. If I make it 32 bytes per bucket, it keeps going. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. All right, but so then here, here's the, the quiz for how it makes sense. Why not just make huge bucket sizes for memory? Why not one megabyte bucket size? So if I had one megabyte bucket size, that is uh, what? Um, 1,024 times 1,024, that's kilobytes, times 1,024 is bytes, times two to the 32nd, that's the number of uh, um, total memory that I can uh, store so uh, in, in bytes. So divided by 1,024 is kilobytes, divided by 1,024 is megabytes, divided by 1,024 is gigabytes, divided by 1,024 is terabytes. Um, so 4,194,304 terabytes of RAM. If I use one megabyte bucket size. Sounds appropriate for an Apple Pro. Just because we can have that much doesn't mean we can afford that much. Okay, well, fine. But that's still not, so you could say, well, that'd be too expensive. So you could say, well, why not make huge bucket sizes? Well, you know, Appel says we can't afford it. Fine, let's say we could. Do you run into like internal fragmentation where you might only be looking for a byte of memory and you're wasting the rest of that megabyte? And you're wasting almost, yeah. So really the problem here is internal fragmentation. Well, does an internal fragmentation come into play based off of cost, though? Because, like today, we have, you know, we if if we had the money, it wouldn't be a problem, right? Uh, you're not you're not wrong. Yeah. So I mean, at some point, you could say, yeah, if I if I if I waste ninety nine uh, percent of a megabyte, who cares? Um, yeah, you, you're right. Um, so someone is also. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is it also a speed thing? Um. There could be some speed things because the bigger your buckets of memory are, the more you're going to have to work through when you go to access the stuff in that bucket. Um, you know, if you go into a, uh, you know, you can clear one egg from a bucket in a carton of eggs very quickly where you couldn't clear an entire garage as quickly because you're holding more stuff in that single bucket of a garage. If that makes sense. So, you know, I think speed is, is a fair, um, you know, that, that comes into play. Somewhere in there it comes into play. Um, I think maybe when we talk about, I mean, so Blaine, you're right, internal fragmentation does say something to uh, um, the cost of memory where we might say, well, you know, who cares if I'm wasteful? But there probably is still a point where you're like unreasonably wasteful, right? So even in real life, you could just say, well, you know, yeah, you know, like for instance, you're you're at some place and you pay cash for something, and there's, you know, 16 cents. Um, you know, you give them a uh, a five dollar bill, and there's 16 cents left over in change. You say, ah, keep the change. 16 cents isn't a big deal, but if you gave them a million dollar bill, and there was, uh, 
998,000, you know, uh, whatever uh, dollars in change, you probably wouldn't just say keep the change, right? Even if you were super, 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 super rich and that wasn't a life changing amount of money, you would probably say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you like a $2 tip, <laughs> you know, not an almost a million dollar tip. So there's some point where human logic kicks in and says that let's be reasonable here. Kind of makes some sense. Um, so internal fragmentation is the amount of memory wasted within a single, and I like to call them buckets. Uh, we're going to specifically, uh, so if we're here, since we're talking about paging memory management, we'll say within a single, well, technically a frame is what holds it. Single page is what has the data in it. So within a single page of memory. So internal fragmentation is the amount of memory wasted within a single page of memory in a paging memory management system. Because remember, I'm angling towards this idea that memory is a generic term, right? You know, we have different kinds of memory and some of that memory behaves differently, but the way we manage that memory is very, very similar, right? And we have to take into consideration the likely size of that memory when we're deciding how to manage it. When we're managing a system RAM, we're kind of looking at 16, 32, 64 gigs of RAM. If we kind of travel back in time a little bit um, to the I-386 days, you know, the idea of having four gigs of RAM was, I mean, that was back then, that would have felt ridiculous. That would have felt like a ridiculous amount of RAM, four gigs, unattainable. We'll never have four gigs of RAM. Um, you know, because I think uh, in the Pentium Pro days, so this gets up to like near where we had uh, the early Celeron processors, um, you know, 32 megabytes of memory was considered a lot. Um, and this is in 1998. You know, where 32 megs of RAM was a lot of RAM. 128 megabytes of RAM was, was possible. And that was like, like why? Who needs that much RAM, right? Well, 128 megabytes of RAM, we wouldn't use to like blow our nose now. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just not sufficient. Like, I won't even buy a toaster that only has that much RAM in it. <laughs> something, something along those lines. So, you know, the, the, oh, Appel has his hand up. I noticed. Um, so, before we kind of get too far ahead, isn't there kind of a second reason why we wouldn't attribute one megabyte of data to a single address and that being register size? Um, well, I don't know that register size really is the reason behind not putting, well, actually, yeah, you're right. For uh, loading a register that would become problematic. Yeah, that's actually, I, that's actually something if we I was Perform a read and it gives us back a megabyte of data. I we need to be able to hold back what it gives us. I was not thinking in that direction, but you are 100% correct. In fact, that's probably more correct than internal fragmentation. Um, internal fragmentation is kind of a, um, the wasteful consequence. You're talking about the architectural limitation, um, which is, I think, more important. That's our starting point. So that's, an ex that's a start for the day. So register size certainly plays into this. That is to say, if our largest register size is 32 bits, four bytes, let's just say that's the case in a, a 386 processor. Um, when we load something from memory into a register, the largest that something can be <laughs> is four bytes. All right, now I've tried this at home where you try to take a gallon of chocolate milk and pour it into a shot glass and you just assume that it will magically all stay in there. It doesn't, <laughs> there's a problem. All right, so if you have a register that only can oh, hold four bytes and you, and you try to dump one megabyte into it, you have a problem. 
So excellent answer, better answer than mine. Um, so, uh, so this would be, let me actually label this. This would be an architectural, architectural limitation. Um, we have to listen to this one. Okay. Down here, it's more just choice. Like Blaine was saying, like, wow, if money is no object, you got plenty of RAM slots. Who cares for wasting most of a megabyte? No B. Um, but yeah, so definitely, it's a, a very good point, so. Um, so I'll actually give you V star for the day. She probably wasn't gonna earn it, but I'll hand it to you anyways. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so again, this stuff ultimately though becomes choices, right? We are choosing as the implementer how these work. We're looking at a legitimate memory management model with paging memory management. Right now we're saying, you know, we're probably gonna max out at four bytes, maybe eight bytes uh, to Appel's point where he says, okay, well, you know, our modern day architectures do have 64 bit uh, registers. So it would not be completely unreasonable to have 64 bit page sizes in memory. It would certainly give us more maximum RAM, but then we have to get to that point with how much RAM can we afford? How much RAM can you physically fit inside the computer? Again, it's an architectural, um, you know, that's kind of the chicken or the egg thing, right? If you have a computer and the biggest size RAM chips that exist are 16 gigabyte chips, let's say, um, realistically the biggest that exists that you can buy regularly are eight gigabyte chips. Um, you know, if that's the case and you can only fit four of those into a machine, well, you can only fit 32 gigs of RAM in there. You don't need to be able to address more than 32 gigs of RAM. So even if we stretch our, you know, we let our mind go a little bit and we say, well, maybe we're going to have 32 gigabyte sticks and maybe we can fit eight of those. So we have 32 times eight. So now I can, I just need to support 256 gigs of RAM. That, that's going to hold us over for a while, right? Do you think 256 gigs of RAM likely gets us uh, to the year uh, 2025? Probably. We could be wrong. You know, somewhere in here, quantum computing is going to kick up, and maybe we don't even measure things in RAM anymore. Now it's going to be in, like, buckets of mayonnaise or something. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, whatever the, the thing is, we can sit here as, as uh, technology experts today and say, it's pretty likely that, you know, it's not gonna be super common for people to have 256 gigs of RAM in five years. There might be somebody, right? It'll be like the me that has 64 gigs of RAM, like, oh yeah, it's that one guy. Now, having said that, we do have systems today that do have two terabytes of RAM in them, but they're specifically architected to be giant servers, things like that, that are meant to have that much RAM in them. They're not consumer pieces of equipment. They were really expensive, you know, specifically engineered to hold a whole bunch of RAM. And if you can only fit eight gigabyte RAM sticks in there, no problem. We'll just give you a whole bunch of places to plug eight gigabyte RAM sticks in. You just plug in 300 of them, go, go to town. Um, so, uh, you know, those things exist and they'll be more special purpose, but those are the things that play into kind of our our decision of what's the what's the worst case scenario that we're trying to target. So as the operating system designer, or we're really talking about a very specific part of the operating system here, as, as the memory manager designer here, what's the largest amount of memory we might realistically, if we take our glasses off and squint, have to deal with? And that's gonna be part of what our decision making is gonna um, come into, but before we even start there, we get a nice hint from our architecture, right? Appel's architecture says, look, your biggest register is four bytes. If you wanna start playing with numbers bigger than that, now we come back to our homework assignment, right? If you wanna play with numbers that don't fit in your registers, what do you have to do? If I only have 32-bit registers and I wanna store a 64-bit number, what do I need? Bigger registers. Or 
I only I only have 32 bit registers. I'm not going to invent a new architecture. So if I only have 32 bit registers, but I want to store a 64 bit number, what do I do? I'm just talking about the at the register size here. Yeah, I have to take it up. I have a 64 bit number, but I only have my largest register is 32 bits. How do I store a 64 bit number when my largest register is only 32 bits? You're going to have to take up multiple registers. Number is. I got multiple registers. I'm going to have to use two registers. You got 64 bits to store? Put your high bits here, put your low bits there. If you need to hold a 128 bit number, you're going to need four registers. We could play this game all day long until we run out of registers. <laughs> right? You know, you you get to some point where you run out of 32 bit registers, you start sack, you start grabbing 16 bit registers, you start grabbing 8 bit registers, you're you're bleeding into the cache. <laughs> you're holding stuff in system RAM and swapping it in. Um, you know, this whole thing is a matter of like MacGyvering um, the solution based on the, the tools you have laying around, right? Now we can be reasonable with this and say, okay, holding a 64 bit number in two 32 bit registers, that doesn't sound like an unreasonable thing. We can probably swing that. In our homework assignment uh, for today, we were uh, splitting between um, uh, what two 16 bit, well, we, we were storing them in hexadecimal for memory addresses. So we actually split the uh, eight, we split the byte size things to, to give us 32 um, bits, four bytes. We needed to use four byte size chunks to split our number, our memory address, right? Um, so we actually went kind of the opposite direction. Instead of having um, uh, memory that was four bytes big, we had memory that was one bytes big with thirty with with four byte memory addresses. Um, so in order to represent our memory address in our system, we had to split our memory addresses across multiple bytes of memory. So it was kind of a fun thing to do by having to imagine saying I have four individual buckets that can hold each hold 25% of my value. So I'm going to split my value up into quarters and put them into those four separate buckets. Again, with the capability of being able to reassemble them later into its original value. So I can use that original value. Okay. So, but I think the starting point for us here, like Appel said, is look, you have to listen to your registers. And if the biggest register you have is 32 bits, you got to take that into consideration when you think, how far can I stretch this um, for what I can, what I can store? Because one of the, one of the primitive functions, one of the, uh, the fundamental things that we have to be able to do is we have to be able to move crap from here to here. <laughs> we have to be able to get stuff from our system memory to our CPU somehow, and usually that's by way of registers. We use loads and stores to move back and forth between uh, memory in uh, assembly language. All right, so that is a uh, going to be a limitation that we have to take into consideration. Okay, so secondarily, we do want to be so even within that, we say, okay, well, the biggest number we can store is this we might say, well, do we need to have that much? Because, so this says, let's say within reason, we can have four byte buckets, because we have 32 bit registers. Um, if we could have four byte buckets, because we have 32 bit registers, um, the most internal fragmentation I would have is 3.999 whatever um, uh, bytes of internal fragmentation because I only used uh, one bit of, of data, something like that. And we can say, oh, that's wasteful, but not that wasteful to Blaine's point earlier. All right, so we do wanna consider internal fragmentation, but we need to make sure it's compatible with our architecture as well. All right, so that's why we don't just make our bucket sizes huge. We need to make something, pick something that solves the problem we're trying to solve, meaning we can hold enough memory um, for the amount of memory we might need to address while still being compatible with our architecture. All right, so now if we start transitioning towards file systems. So if we think about 
system RAM versus hard drives are we buy a new computer today, the average system RAM size is what, maybe 16, 16 gigabytes, eight gigabytes? All right, so 16 is probably high, but we're probably getting right to that borderline where machines just start shipping with 16. So we'll call it 16 gigabytes. All right, so you know, that, that would be considered a pretty good computer today. You bought a computer with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Now that same computer that came with 16 gigabytes of RAM, um, how big is the hard drive uh, on that computer? And let's just deal with um, uh, mechanical hard drives right now, otherwise, because we could do the math if we translated to solid state drives. So if you came with a mechanical hard drive, how big would that mechanical hard drive be? At least two terabytes. Probably two terabytes, yeah. So it's a two terabyte hard drive. So two times 1,024 is a 2048 gigabyte. So just to put it into, so that's 2048 divided by 16. So 128 times the size. So our hard drives are 128 times bigger than our system RAM in a realistic example. Okay, so a lot more. Whoop, I wonder where I, what I swapped there. So these guys have a whole bunch more memory that we need to address than these guys do. So the approach we take to manage the memory on our hard drives might be different than the approach we use to manage the memory on our system RAM, right? The way we use the hard drives is different and the amount of stuff we have to address is different, even though there's, there, it's a similar approach in that we have a bunch of buckets of hard drive memory and each one of those buckets has to be uniquely addressed somehow, okay? So this was two terabytes, 2048 gigabytes. So hard drives are 128 times larger than RAM. Ish. <laughs> I think that's, that's fair enough. Okay. So any way you cut it, Now we're back to almost a, a data structure type thing. When we have a collection of stuff, in this case, hard drives, uh, um, so uh, a register, a system RAM, a hard drive, cache, these are all collections of bytes, right? And how we organize those bytes, these are all big arrays, if you will. How we organize them and how we address them is important. So when we're addressing a collection, and we'll keep it in the memory world here. So a collection of bytes. We have to be able to count high enough to address all of the buckets of memory where each bucket has a number of bytes associated with it. The fewer the bytes associated with a single bucket, the larger the number we need to count to, or the smaller the total amount of bytes we can have. There's our trade-off. So we either have to count higher or have less memory. One of the two. All right, so I'll put that in. So we either need to be able to count higher or have less total memory. So, 
when we're dealing with system RAM, we talk about a, we use memory addresses to ask, you know, to count the, or to index, I like index, to index the individual buckets. When we're dealing with a hard drive, we have to think about implementation of file systems for how we're going to keep track of our things in our hard drive, all right? And we have something called a, um, well, here, actually, let me, I'll just put a little question mark here. So we have this thing called file systems. What file systems have you heard of? At 32. Okay. NTFS. So I'm gonna throw fat. It was a fat 12, I think. There's a fat 32. We have NTFS. What about like HFS? HFS. So HFS is a Unix file system used by Mac, right? Yeah, I think it's Apple. Yep. But it's Unix based. Francisco um, said XFAT. Okay. Yeah, XFAT is equivalent to, I think it's FAT16. Because um, it's a DOS compatible. Uh, but it might be FAT32. But yeah, that, that's a, it's a backward compatible with those. We're going to name ours. It's awesome. All right, so we, you know, there's more, right? In fact, if you uh, go into the Linux world, they, we, uh, not that long ago, they started with these uh, journaling file systems uh, that allow you to roll back and kind of recover from correct, corrupt files and things like that. But, you know, let's call these our popular ones. Really, it's FAT32 versus NTFS. If we were talking about uh, real world here or uh, HFS or UFS, Unix file system. Um, so FAT32 versus NTFS, what can you tell me? Isn't FAT32 generally based off of a uh, kind of master table of records? Okay, so what NTFS? Um, tell me more of the practical stuff instead of the implementation stuff. We'll talk about some implementation stuff here in a little bit, but um, if you get a new USB stick or you get an external USB hard drive, what's it usually formatted with? FAT32. FAT32. So external USB stick is usually FAT32. Why? I don't know. <laughs> That's good. I want to say it's simpler, but I don't really know. There's a very good reason for this. How many of you have a, uh, a USB jump drive? All of us have that, <laughs> right? We have probably a pile of them where, you know, sometimes we question which one has more stuff on it, right? Um, so, and they also have the different speeds. But, uh, you know, we all have, we all have one of those. Um, what kind of computers do you plug those into? All. Yeah, whatever computer you have in front of you, right? So if I plug a FAT32 formatted jump drive into a PC, it works just fine, right? If I plug it into a Mac, it also works just fine. But if I plug an NTFS uh, jump, formatted jump drive, which you can reformat your jump drive NTFS if you want, no harm, no foul. If you plug it into a PC, it works just fine. You plug it into a Mac, doesn't can't use it, doesn't know about it. You plug it into a Linux box, it probably doesn't know about it, although there is some experimental NTFS support in Linux that might let you, with possible negative consequences, read and write from that disk, at least read from that disk. Linux can usually read from an NTFS disk. All right, but punchline is, is that FAT32 It is universally compatible with Windows, Mac, Linux. 
throw it out there like that. NTFS only works on Windows, let's say, and sort of Linux. So more importantly, NTFS is a proprietary file system. Okay, so um, the FAT in FAT32, so if I go and look up FAT32 here, we have something called a file allocation table. So the way that all the FAT file systems work is by using something called a file allocation table. We'll come back to it here in a second. This is a lookup table, kind of like Unicode or ASCII. It's, got, it's a lookup table that lets us translate from one value to another, okay? To keep track of where things are on our hard drive. And I'll leave it at that for a second, we'll come back to this. Because now we're starting to talk about how do we implement management of hard drives, memory management of our hard drive, as opposed to how do we implement memory management of system memory. And it all comes down to is how are we using those tools and who has to use those tools? Who has to have, have access to them? Okay, so I'm gonna leave this up, but we'll come back to it here in a few minutes. So, FAT, we'll call this the FATX file systems, are, I don't, they, they predate open source, so I don't think it's fair to say they're open source, but they are uh, um, not owned, I don't believe, by any individual entity or at least nobody that protects them. So let's just say are unprotected algorithms. Let's say non-proprietary. Proprietary. Non-proprietary. Nailed it. That's a hard word to spell. I didn't know if I had one R or seven. All right, so <laughs> what's really sad, Blaine, is I'm not exaggerating. I did not know if it was one or seven. <laughs> it was one of the two. <laughs> I was bouncing back and forth between those two. All right. So this is non-proprietary algorithm, hence the reason why we, you know, they work on Mac and Windows and blah, blah, blah. So they, you know, we have that jump drive that's formatted with that. We can plug it into any of those machines. Um, and FAT32 is our most modern. What can you tell me about it? Well, we already said works on all OSs. Any limitations? Anybody tell me about a limitation you've run into with a uh, USB jump drive? Four gigabyte uh, file size. Ah, what's that file? You said four gigabyte, right? Yep. It's the max size of an int. Yep. Isn't there like a restriction on file name length too? Uh, there is actually. There is a file length, uh, file name length as well. Um, I think that's more of an inconvenience, but the uh, the the um, size limitation is a big one. So max file size is two to the thirty second bytes. So two to the 32nd bytes divided by 1024 is kilobytes, divided by 1024 is megabytes, divided by 1024 is gigabytes. That 32 is a 32-bit file system for gigabytes is the maximum file size. So if you've downloaded your, uh, you know, uh, a Blu-ray movie and it's 13 gigabytes you can't store that file on your uh, usb stick it's gonna you know even if you have a uh, um, a, a 16 gig or a 32 gig or 128 gig jump drive whatever it is 
you have enough total space because you, um, uh, it's formatted in FAT32, you can't store a file larger than four gigabytes on it. Why is that? The same reason we've been talking about stuff for the last hour. We can't count that high. All right, so max file size is four gigabytes. Why four gigabytes? We use a 32-bit file allocation table. So we can only uniquely identify 2 to the 32nd unique buckets of hard drive memory. It's starting to, starting to sound like a little repetitive here. Okay, so now we ask the question, well, how big is a bucket of hard drive memory? Well, maybe it's four bytes. Maybe it's one byte. Okay, so FAT32 uses four bytes, or I'm sorry, uses uh, one byte memory chunks. And we'll divide up your, uh, um, your file, so your three gigabyte file, let's say, it'll divide it up, it'll chop it up into little tiny pieces like your, your mincing onions. Okay, it'll, it'll chop it up and put it in different places throughout uh, your, uh, your hard drive. And the file allocation table keeps track of where the pieces of a specific file can live on that, uh, uh, on that hard drive, okay? So that's how big we can count is up to, um, uh, we can only store four gigabytes of data because if each bucket of memory is one byte big, then two to the 32nd lets us re uh, represent, for the same reason as that was how we ran into with, with system RAM, lets us represent two to the 32nd unique buckets of memory that comes out to four gigabytes of RAM or four gigabytes of total storage space that our file allocation table can address. Even if your uh, drive has uh, 16 gigs of storage on it, your file allocation table cannot allocate, cannot keep track of that much memory. So what do you have to do? If you have a, a 16 gigabyte uh, um, jump drive and you want it to hold more stuff, I'm waiting for somebody to correct me here. How many of you have larger than a four gigabyte jump drive? And how many of you have something that's larger than a four gigabyte jump drive that's formatted FAT32? Well, we already started off this conversation by saying all, all jump drives, when you take them out of the box, are formatted FAT32, right? For a good reason. So you can plug it into all the computers, right? So several of you have larger than a four gigabyte jump drive that's formatted FAT32. How does if that work? I, if I remember correctly, when you plug it into, well, when you plug in one to a, like NTFS, doesn't it say this Windows can't read the file and then you've had to format it as a certain? Yeah, if it's NTFS. But I'm telling you, if you bought, let's just use a specific example. How many of you have like a 16 gigabyte jump drive? All right, 16 gigabyte jump drive. So if Blaine were to plug that guy into his computer, it's gonna say, this is FAT32. No harm, no foul. Go ahead. Does it change the, like, the the bucket size yep. to four bytes instead? Then yep. okay, bucket size will go up to go, go up to a larger byte size. So FAT thirty two, as opposed to FAT sixteen, as opposed to FAT twelve, as opposed to FAT FAT used a uh, one byte um, uh, bucket size. FAT twelve I think used two bytes. Uh, FAT16, I think, used four bytes. FAT32, I believe, uses eight bytes. So I think FAT32 will support up to a 16 terabyte hard drive, whatever that number is. Go ahead. Blame. So 
Okay, got, that makes more sense. So it, it doesn't just kind of uh, dynamically change whenever you plug it in. And oh, say, no, no, no. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, the, the files, <laughs> so it, it being formatted FAT32 dictates the, the uh, um, what's called the cluster size. So buckets in file systems are usually called clusters. Um, buckets in system memory are called pages um, for our paging uh, memory management. <laughs> that was actually pretty funny. My, my hand made a weird thing and I'm looking, I just happened to glance at my picture of me with Perkins in the background and I thought that like a person was walking out of Perkins. <laughs> <laughs> like man, I think these guys are supposed to be on lockdown. <laughs> this shouldn't be happening. And I said, "All oh, you can eat pancakes through the drive-through window at Perkins." All right, yeah. So, um, uh, so actually, let me just do the math on that real quick. So, if I have a um, eight-byte cluster, so I have two to the thirty-second times eight. Divided by 1,024, divided by 1,024, divided by 1,024. Well, it's actually got to be bigger than that. Uh, let me work backwards. Is it? Maybe it's two terabytes. So two to the 32nd is the number of bytes. If I say I want to store 16 byte clusters, that's going to be the total number of bytes my hard drive can hold. Divided by 1,024 is kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes. So two. Four. Do the cluster sizes change depending on like maybe like the manufacturer if, it, if it's going to be a 32? Uh, FAT32 30, FAT has a set cluster size. Let's just look it up real quick. FAT32 cluster. Thirty-two kilobyte. Uh, this is for one hundred twenty-eight gigabytes. Oh yeah, interesting. So Sixteen gigabytes at thirty-two. But notice the cluster size is in kilobytes. It's not bytes. So kilobytes. That's actually. 4096 for uh, four kilobytes. Yeah, there's your 16 terabyte number. But punchline here is it's, it's the same thing we looked at with memory, right? We just adjusted our bucket size. Something just happened to Blaine. What happened? Well, I just remembered like looking at, um, you know, like just like a text file in Windows or something like that or whatever, just making a simple text file without anything in it. It's like four, four kilobytes. I was like, why is it so big? It's just. Um, well, cluster size. the hard drive would have a cluster that would be 4K, but you could still have a file that was smaller than 4K. Okay. You would have internal fragmentation. Yeah. Right? But, you, know, you wouldn't use the entire four kilobyte uh, cluster. Mm -hmm. So sure. I'm guessing it was just luck of the draw that it was a 4K file. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, you know, so in any case here, we're seeing the exact same model, but instead of looking at one byte, four bytes, eight bytes uh, bucket size, page size, we're looking at four kilobyte page size in uh, FAT32. Uh, let's say, which will give you a total storage of 16 terabytes. If I divide this by another 1,024. 
give our six, give us our 16. All right, so we were at gigabyte before, now we're at uh, terabytes. All right, so 16 terabytes of hard drive space. Well, that's gonna take us pretty far um, with FAT32, but we have, two, we have two problems here. We have to think about how does the file allocation table work versus how, um, versus how does the format for FAT32 work? Because there's two separate things here. When you're dealing with hard drives, and I'm gonna travel back in time a little bit here. If you go back to uh, Windows um, 95, how many of you in here use Windows 95? Is that a thing? Not so I'm going to look my first laptop. Okay. Um, do you remember, did you have a hard drive bigger than four gigabytes? So actually, did you have a hard drive bigger than 2.1 gigabytes? I want to say it was like three gigs, but I could be remembering wrong. Okay. Um, so with FAT16, we have a couple of things we're, we're looking at here. Um, and actually, it doesn't really matter if we think about it in terms of FAT16. I'm really showing you a FAT16 example uh, from Win95 days. This was the time period when um, larger hard drives were just starting to come out. So at the, um, you know, the time period uh, when Windows 95 first came out, it probably was not uncommon to have um, a 500 megabyte hard drive. 600 megabyte hard drive, so something smaller than a gigabyte. Gigabytes were, uh, a gigabyte hard drive would have been very large. Um, you know, not, not impossibly large, but a pretty expensive computer might be, would have had a one gig hard drive uh, when Windows 95 first came out. Um, but pretty quickly, as the price of memory came down and hard drives got bigger and bigger and bigger, you could get hard drives that were bigger than four gigabytes, you might be able to get a six gigabyte hard drive. But what would happen, or even a four gigabyte hard drive would, be, would work for this example. So let's say you bought a four gigabyte hard drive uh, back then. What you would end up having to do is Windows would not allow you to create a single four gigabyte partition. What's a partition when we talk about hard drives? This is a new word for us today. A division. Okay, so partition. So this is a division within a single hard disk. Okay, and I'm just going to kind of give us a little hint here. Each division is governed by a file allocation table. Okay, so what we were stuck doing is we had to create two, 2.1 gig was the uh, uh, largest partition size you could have. Two 2.1 gig partitions. You could format each of those partitions. So partitions are not, uh, they are not linked to the uh, file system. So because you wanted to format FAT32, or in this case it was FAT16, the largest you could, the largest hard drive, single hard drive you could manage with FAT16 was 2.1 gigabytes. Therefore, Windows would partition your drive into 2.1 gigabyte chunks. And each of those chunks would be governed by its own file system. Does that make sense? Um, so you would have one physical hard drive that would show up as two different hard drives, for example, in our four gigabyte example here, here, just so it, uh, just so the math works out nicely for us. We'll say it's a 4.2 gigabyte hard drive. So we would get two 2.1 gigabyte uh, partitions. It would show up as like a C and a D drive, for example, in our computer, 
even though we knew that under the hood, it was a single physical machine, a single physical hard drive. And it had to do this because FAT16 could not count high enough to, we're going to just say address, larger than 2.1 gigabytes of hard drive clusters. Okay, completely taking away from the idea of what uh, FAT16 was. That's not what this class is about. The OS class would have talked about the individual, uh, we assume you talked about like FAT16 or FAT32 or something like that in there. Killing me, people. But punchline would be, uh, and we just looked it up, we looked up FAT32, but a traditional operating systems class would talk about the, you know, the actual algorithms that are used in practice, paging memory management, things like that, um, where in like a systems programming class or an operating system implementation class like we're looking at here, we care more about the ideas behind the um, implementation of file systems, what their approach was. So one of these things that you know I want to really drive home here is the similarities between hard drive and system memory in that in both cases we are talking about the individual buckets of this memory and being able to count high enough to talk about that type of thing in terms of how big it is, right? If I have a, you know, for instance, a couple slides ago, you told me that a modern day computer might have a, what, a two terabyte hard drive or something like that, wherever it was in here. Yeah, we have a two terabyte hard drive. FAT16 ain't gonna cut it, <laughs> all right? FAT32 would. We just saw that a few minutes ago where um, uh, FAT32 can up, go up to 16 terabytes of hard drive space using a 4K cluster size. So each bucket, the, the smallest little container in our hard drive can hold four kilobytes. You had five kilobytes, you bleed into the next container. So if you had a single 5K file, I'm just talking generically here, a single 5K file will actually span two separate clusters in your hard drive. It would take up the entirety of one 4K cluster, and it would take up 25% of a second 4K cluster, giving you 3K of internal fragmentation. All right, but the important thing is you have your single five kilobyte file separated. We've split it up, and we've put them in different places in memory. And by the way, it doesn't have to be contiguous. So you can have the first part of your file in bucket nine of memory, and then your second part of your file, that one byte, you know, the second, uh, uh, the one byte left over after your four bytes to give you your five byte file, you know, it might be all the way down at the other end of, me of your hard drive. And when you go to read that file into memory, it, those things need to be reassembled and then loaded in the system, system RAM. And after you've reassembled the file and loaded it in the system RAM, what do you have to do? I've reassembled it, now I need to, chop it up again to put it into individual pages in, in system memory. This is like Iron Chef when we're thinking about operating systems, right? We're constantly chopping up stuff and putting them in, you know, dividing it up. Okay, I'll put a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and I got to keep track of where I put all that stuff. What is that? File allocation table. That's me keeping track of where I put all that crap, okay? So when I need to reassemble a file, I got to go and grab from all the clusters. I can put it back together, and then where do files go when we work on them? They go into system memory. So if we just think about how our computers work, things are long-term stored here in non-volatile memory, and they're stored divided up individual clusters. When we have a file that we want to work on, we open up Microsoft Word, for example, and we have our 6, 7, 20K file, whatever it is, that guy gets reassembled here, then loaded into system memory. Well, we've already talked about system memory usually uses some sort of paging memory management that might be four byte page sizes, um, something like that. Not 4K, but four byte, 32 bit page sizes. So now after I just spent all my time reassembling my nice uh, file, after put, putting together all those clusters, now I need to load it into memory, so I gotta chop it back up into individual pages. All right, now, if this is where it's stored long-term, and this is our eating trough, 
right? So <laughs> we feed off of this trough, but who feeds off it? The CPU does. When the CPU starts bringing stuff in from system memory, it's bringing it in one page at a time, one portion of that file at a time. Does that make sense? Okay, so as we're making all these different little components talk to each other, even though they're all the same kind of thing, they're all memory. Everything's about having stuff stored somehow in a place that is fast, all right? But as we move it from one place to another, we have to adapt to the format of our destination. So we're going to you know, reconstruct our file here, then adapt it to the format of system memory splitting it back up into more chunks than we had before, but different chunks, different size chunks. Put it in the system memory. When we start bringing it into the CPU, we have to take little bite-sized bytes, right? Well, that's probably four bite-sized bytes. <laughs> bytes, are, taking bytes of it is probably the wrong analogy <laughs> since I'm meaning byte, B-Y-T-E, and byte, B-I-T-E. But, you know, you can only feed off a portion of the file at any point in time. And that's what you bring into a register, all right? Because you're bringing one page into a register at a time and then operating on that data, whatever you're going to do. For instance, writing a byte to the frame buffer, like we've looked at, okay? Actually, we write two bytes to the frame buffer, right? We write, what's the character? Foreground color, background color. So. Every two bytes is a single character with a, with a color to the frame buffer, for example. So if we had this giant Word document or something like that, or a giant text file stored on our hard drive, we would um, have it split across our hard drive into various clusters. We would recombobulate it. Then we would discombobulate it into pages. Then we can read pages in from a base address, one after another after another, um, assuming our file IO worked with contiguous memory. Doesn't have to, but assuming it did, um, we could read it in page by page by page and then go through those pages. Let's say the pages are four bytes. Uh, we can get two characters out of four bytes, right? So we can show two characters uh, to the frame buffer from one page in memory. Then we got to load the next page in memory, get our next two characters. Next page in memory, get our next two characters. So everything is about adapting for how things are stored in these different areas of the computer. Okay? And if we want to connect this to the programming language world side of things, these are data representation languages. Right? Here we represent things four bytes at a time. Here we represent things four kilobytes at a time. We're still using bits in both of them, but we just kind of group our bits differently uh, in these different languages. Here we're, we're sometimes operating off of one byte or two bytes at a time, all right? So the way we represent our data dictates how we work with that data. Just like the assignment for this week where we were forced into taking a 32-bit memory address and splitting it across four bytes. Make sense? Okay. Let's see, where do I go? Let's go down here. All right, so the FAT16 example. If I had one 4.2 gigabyte hard drive, it would have to be treated as two 2.1 gigabyte partitions in Windows because the FAT16 file system, the, the uh, table, the lookup table for that, could only handle 2.1 gigabytes of cluster sizes at a time. And that makes sense because of how high it could count. Okay, whatever the rules it played by, whatever the cluster size was and whatever the address size was. Um, those two things put together allowed us to not count high enough to get past 2.1 gigabytes. So if you wanna address uh, more than that and you got more hard drive space, no problem, just create another partition. That partition has its own uh, uh, file allocation table and now you can start over, move on with life. Now you did give yourself a little bit of a problem there in that you now can't have a single file spread across more than one partition. So only a single cluster allows you, only a single uh, partition, all of a file that you've split up into clusters can exist in a single partition. You can't split it across multiple partitions without bringing in another level of management, right? Um, 
Anybody, uh, what if I have multiple hard drives that I want to store files across? Do we have any technology that you've heard of that lets you store one file, store half of it on one hard drive, half of it on another hard drive, for example? RAID. RAID. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's another tool that sits on top of that. So a RAID system says, okay, give me some hard drives, tell me how you want me to manage these guys, and then you send me data and I'll put it where I think it should go. And part of the, the, the extra perk of RAID says, well, what can I do with this? Well, I can reconstruct a broken hard drive. Because a lot of times I'm storing stuff twice. I'll put a little bit here and I'll also put it over here. Or maybe I'm even storing it four times, just depending on what the situation is. You know, there's different approaches to it, but it's another management strategy. Okay, so forget about what the fancy schmancy names are. Forget about even what the details are of these things. These are management strategies that allow us to accomplish a task. Okay, what does a file, uh, what does a file system allow us to accomplish? It allows us to store files. And what's a file? A file is a collection of bits on a hard drive in such a way that it does not necessarily have to be stored contiguously on the hard drive. Now, let's get down to that level of things. What's a file? This is a collection of bits. That's all it is, right? Collection of bits. How we interpret those bits mean different things, right? If it's a, uh, um, you know, if we want to uh, interpret the, if it's an ASCII file, we'll interpret these bits, uh, these these bits, uh, eight bits at a time, one byte at a time, and that will give meaning to them, right? We we take a byte, we look it up on the ASCII table, we get a character. Take the next byte, look it up on the ASCII character table, we get a character. Okay, so if it's an ASCII format, we have that. If it's Unicode format, we have that. If it's, uh, what if it's just binary data? Um, so let's say that we're uh, dealing with um, how are movies stored? So if you're, when you're streaming something, this is something we take for granted today, right? You, you sit down at your TV, you just hit a couple of buttons and Netflix is playing, yeah, right? It's, that's, that's simple stuff, right? So you, you know, somehow you're streaming this four gigabyte file down to your uh, TV almost instantly over what you probably think is junky internet. Um, and you're somehow able to watch your show and it seems to look okay and things like that. What, what's that play there? How are we managing that? How is, a, uh, how is a TV show or a movie stored? Remember, memory is memory is memory. So I have right. four, go ahead. Bit right. Like... Okay, well, so that's how it's streamed. It's streamed from a bitrate perspective. Um, so let's get to bitrate here in a second. We'll just we'll, we'll close the circle here. So first of all, we're going to have our uh, our file that is our representation of our movie is going to be a collection of bits, bytes, however you want to think about it, right? Bits. At the very least, it's a collection of bits. How you want to digest those is up to you. Um, now, when you go to what? How do you watch a movie? On your computer you click play yeah you need a player now when you okay. click the play that that play is a button in a piece of software is it not yeah yeah whether it's quicktime or movie player or if you're on your tv netflix is a software application you hit play and it, it, it magically starts playing it right okay so you have a piece of software that is interpreting bits that are flowing towards it in some way now, what, is, what are movies? What's the difference between movies and still pictures? It's a collection. A collection of still audio. pictures, right? Okay, oh, yeah, with, with audio, too. We got, yeah, we got, we got a whole bunch of stuff going on there, right? Man, those days when we think about before, we just had color images, or we had white, black and white images, then we had color images. Now they want to have color images, or then we want to have black and white images that are silent movies. So we just show a bunch of those images at once. Then we want color silent movies and show a bunch of those images at once. Now we want to have sound too. So you got to have a whole second track, right? You got to get those things to line up. You know, don't you hate that with Netflix when the sound is off with the video? <laughs> 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 oh, 
all these things that you are thinking about from real life, this is all, it's all related. This is all the same kind of crap, all right? So when you're downloading something from Netflix, you have a big file that has to get from Netflix to your TV, to your computer. Go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna ask, so it doesn't download the whole file before you can start watching it, right? Nope. You can start watching as soon as it has some of it going. Correct, yep, so that now we have to say, well, how do we get that file? Okay, so you got this big old file, four gigabyte file. I'm just picking a number out of the sky, but four gigabytes is probably a reasonable size for a, um, you know, a, a, a decent an hour long TV show or something like that. It depends on the resolution, but let's just use four gigabytes as our number. But when you hit play, you, you, you want it to go. You know, what's the most amount of time you're willing to wait? Maybe, maybe like four or five seconds, something sure. like that. I mean, man, we have really become jerks, haven't we? Man, we are not willing to wait for nothing. And we, we, we don't care. Like, what do you, you don't tell me my internet's too slow. This is what I'm willing to pay for. You give me my 4K video now. <laughs> That's what we say. Okay, so now there's, a, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Somehow, Netflix has to use whatever our internet connection is to get us that movie to us so that we could watch it on our TV. And it'll start playing. It'll buffer it, right? It'll start playing it because it just has to have enough of those individual still pictures to show us enough of them in a row to keep up with whatever my, our internet speed is so it can download in the background. Right? Okay. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing that. Uh, now, like for instance, when I watch Netflix, I have, uh, uh, I subscribe to 4K uh, Netflix. So some of their shows are in 4K. That's, that's going to, that's moving more data, right? So you have to have even a faster internet connection. Well, um, am I moving? Do you think I'm downloading raw 4K video? Or do you think 4K, or do you think Netflix is doing something special to the video before it tries to send to me? Probably. Someone's okay. special. What, what's a, what's a, so you, do, you already told me that a, uh, a video is a series of pictures, right? Put together. Okay, what's a picture? It's also, which is also a file. Bunch of pixels. Bunch of pixels. What's a pixel? So it's a little colored dot per screen that lights up. <laughs> okay, so okay, let's say video streaming. So what's a video? Video is a collection of pictures with audio. What's a picture? It's a collection of pixels. Mm -hmm. What's a pixel? It's a type of phone that Google sells. <laughs> well, in the context of a picture, what's a pixel? What problem are pixels solving? The uh, little. Yeah. <laughs> They're solving the, co the, the color dot of light, right? That's the problem. We get a little <laughs> dot. We get a little dot on the screen that's lit up and it has a color. That's what a pixel is, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So that color can be 16 bit color. It could be 24 bit RGB, right? Red, green, blue, eight bits per. So maybe we have 24 bits. So we have um, three by eight bit gives us 24 bits RGB color. This is just one of the formats for pixels. Okay, there's a whole bunch of them. Let's just say this is the one we're using. So that means we need 24 bits per pixel. How many pixels are there in a picture? <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> As we say, we said this is a collection of pixels in a picture. Well, how many pixels are there? 10,000, 100,000. Well, what are, when you think about uh, you're watching a TV show, what are the different resolutions that are common? So maybe 1920 by 1080, that's like regular HD. Mm -hmm. So 1920 by 1080 is standard HD. This like is the number, uh, oh, I brought my 1920. So this is my standard so that is 2 billion pixels, right? Times, times 
uh, 24 bits per pixel. So I have 49 billion bits to make up a single HD picture. Each pixel is 24 bits. I have 1920 by 1080 pixels. So that means I have 49,766,000, or sorry, 49,766,400 bits in a single frame of a high definition picture. How many frames do we watch TV shows at? Is it 30 frames per second? Could be 24 frames, could be 30 frames. A lot of times um, what we consider to be video games or something is 30 frames, but okay. you know, let, let, we'll be, let's we'll operate off of 30, 30 is fine. Okay, so we have that. So that's for a single picture. So video is, and we're even leaving the audio out of this right now, right? This is pictures at 30 frames per second. So that means every second, because this is only one picture, I need to see 30 of those per second. So times 30, that's the number of bits per second that my TV has to show me. 1,492,992,000 um, bits per second. Go ahead. Let me divvy that up to being the bytes or millibytes or megabytes real quick. Yep. Yeah. So that's 1,024 is kilobytes, 1,024, that's megabytes, 1,024, that's gigabytes. 1.4 gigabytes. That's bits, oh, right? Yeah, sorry, sorry. Gigabits, yep. 1,024, and then we do that uh, divided by eight. 0.17 gigabytes of data. So if you want to do megabytes. 178 megabytes per second for high definition video. Right? Pretty, it's pretty fast. Now let me ask you something. Um, with your internet speed, do you ever get 178 megabytes per second download? Uh, jump back to the bits. <laughs> jump back to the bits. Uh, so that is uh, bits. That's gigabits. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe like half that's, that. That's megabits. That's what you want. Uh -oh. Gigabits is 1,423 megabits. So this is faster than gigabit internet. This is 1.423 gigabit internet. <laughs> Just to get you an HD movie. I'm not going to watch HD when there's 4K. Come on. Okay, but we're, de we're dealing with HD. We're going to say that um, you know most of us are, are going to have stuff capable of, of HD. So how do we do this? If in order to watch an HD movie, I need to be able to handle 178 megabytes per second to stream 30 frames per second to my TV, which will go to my eyes to show enough pixels um, to show me a movie. Go ahead. How do you accomplish this? Are they compressing stuff? Mm. Yeah, so we're going to need another management tool, right? Okay, we're going to need to come up with a way of uh, compressing this stuff before we send it because we need to get a Netflix movie, which is stored somewhere in the cloud, right? And it needs to get to my TV in front of me. And even though that file might be a four gigabyte file, um, let's say, um, or, you know, a single a single uh, a second of that might be 178 megabytes. Um, uh, it needs to get to me, and we've already decided that our internet can't handle 178 megabytes per second yet, right? You know, very few people's internet can, is going to be able to, to, to deal with that. Um, and I mean very, very few. I have gigabit at my house, so I can't handle that. Um, but, you know, point is, is that would Netflix have a very good business model if only... <laughs> 0.00001% of the world's population could watch their shows, not even in 4K. 
No, no, they need it to work for everybody. You got to be able to watch it on your cell phone. You got to be able to watch it in your toaster, your to new toilet paper rolls. It doesn't matter where it's at. You should be able to watch streaming video, right? It's got to work. Okay, so you mentioned, oh, maybe there's compression. Again, another management tool. We are making data compatible for transmission to another tool. So, well, you know, we're not going to talk about the details of compression here, but we have effectively a whole bunch of bits and a whole bunch of, uh, you know, to make up our pixels. So there's going to be patterns within there where we might say there's a whole lot of empty space, right? Where we can maybe mathematically represent our data so that it can be reconstructed someplace else. So I can compress it up at Netflix, send it in a small package, and then decompress it on the other end so I can actually show it on my TV. Make sense? Okay, so these are other tools that allow us to get data from point A to point B in maybe a smaller package and then use uh, computer logic, a computer program that will decompress it, reconstruct. That's what decompression is, right? Decompression is a, a fancy way of saying, I'm gonna reconstruct my original data. Because you only, you send it to me in a partial uh, mathematical format or something like that. Okay, and then we're gonna start showing it to you. We still have to show it to you 100, at 178 uh, megabytes per second, but hopefully if you have it local, uh, that's gonna be, now we're operating kind of at the speed of light with electricity on your uh, uh, screen. So we have a better chance of handling it at that point. That makes sense? Okay, so, so now the success of Netflix, what's their secret sauce? You know, we spent the last 10 minutes here boiling down Netflix secret sauce. It's their compression. Okay, it's how does Netflix get their content compressed to us in such a way that we can handle it with less than ideal internet connections and still watch shows and be at the very least convinced they're in HD or convinced they're in 4K, mm -hmm. right? They might not be. We might be fooling our eyes. They might be removing some data for us. You know, the blacks might not be as black as we want them to be. You know, maybe the colors are washed out or whatever because uh, when we... When we decompress the data, we and a little bit was lost in the translation, um, but we're going to call it good enough. And what doesn't hurt, what, what we don't know doesn't hurt us, uh, is is the that type of thing with their proprietary uh, uh, compression algorithms. All right, but the idea here is is that we're still talking about data, and we're still talking about management tools for managing data. So if we are saying I need to store a file. A file is a collection of bits. I need to store it on my hard drive. Where do we store these? Well, how big is a file? We don't know, right? All sorts of sizes, all right? So, um, you know, that's why we have that bigger hard drive because our uh, we, we know we're going to, you know, we're not working with these, uh, you know, um, this, this byte, um, two byte, four byte size chunks that we are kind of typically used to working with at the uh, CPU level, right? When we're working on the uh, hard drive, you know, we're, we're thinking about files as being more like, you know, three megabytes for like an MP3 or 700 megabytes for like a CD ISO or four gigabytes for a DVD ISO, so on and so forth, you know, that kind of stuff. So the, the files are kind of at a different scale. But the good news is hard drives are also the storage is at a different scale. Um, so that's okay, but it's still memory and we still have to manage it. So where do we store these? We store them on the hard drive. Specifically, divided up into a bunch of clusters on the hard drive. Where a cluster is a bucket of memory on the hard drive of a fixed size dictated by the file system. 
All right, so we have to have some sort of standard that we're gonna use to store these files on our hard drive. And chances are, it doesn't matter what cluster size we pick, there's gonna be a file that's too big to fit in one cluster. Otherwise, we're back to the question, the conversation we had, I don't know, an hour and a half ago about, well, why not just have a maximum size, you know, have our cluster be uh, two terabytes. It all fits. <laughs> well, if you, have, if you have a two terabyte cluster size, and you have a two terabyte hard drive, guess how many files you can store? Uh, one. One. One <laughs> file with, with a high likelihood of extreme internal fragmentation. <laughs> extreme internal fragmentation. It's like we got uh, Blaine's 4K file. It'll fit comfortably. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> You know, what we really want, we want to create that scenario of like, if you're going to take a Mike Littman and you're going to put him in a rental car, I fit in an economy car. Getting in and out of it is a little bit sketch. But once I'm in, I fit. <laughs> when Dr. Wall and I traveled to Ann Arbor uh, um, earlier this year, we, uh, well, I guess last year, uh, we, uh, our rental car was a Prius. Um, it's actually funny because we took the train and we get in like in the middle of the night and there's no rental car companies there open. So uh, we did uh, this thing called, um, uh, oh, it'll come to me, but whatever. It's like, it's kind of like um, Uber, but for rental cars. Um, it's it's a uh, popular one. I'm sure you've heard of it. But in any case, we paid a little extra and they actually delivered it to the train station. So we got off the train like at two in the morning. Our, our Prius was sitting right there. The keys were in it. So we got on it. It was a little sketch getting in and out of a Prius. But once I was in, it was quite roomy. Okay. But we had very, very, very little internal fragmentation. <laughs> I filled the space. Okay? If you want a better example, just use your imagination about an airline bathroom. <laughs> Zero internal fragmentation. <laughs> <laughs> zero, zero internal fragmentation. So these are uh, geek jokes, I guess. All right. So the punchline is, is that, but now if you Dr. Litman, I have a question. Oh, V, I'm in the middle of telling inappropriate jokes. Have you, have you break any bedrooms in the, like the toilet in the airplane? Have I broken, and this is all recorded. Have I broken <laughs> toilets on a, an airplane? What are you trying to say here? Yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, hold on, are you calling me fat? No, I'm just telling, I'm just asking the truth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I, have, I have not broken an uh, a airplane uh, toilet. Um, I do have some fairly funny stories that have occurred on airplanes related to their bathrooms, but... Uh, probably not for recording <laughs> type material, uh, but I have never broken one yet. <laughs> um, okay, so in any case, let me just kind of wrap up this uh, this idea here. Is we, uh, you know, we pick a cluster size that is likely to be compatible with the types of things we're likely to store in our computers. Okay, so if like Blaine used the example, like, oh, I saw a 4K file. I mean, that seemed pretty small. Well, if when we start thinking about file size, if 4K or 8K, if, if these types of things feel like, well, they're big, but not that big, most files are not going to be smaller than that. Maybe that's kind of a good starting point for uh, um, uh, for getting these things uh um, in and out of, um, of memory because we know we're going to have to divide up our files. Our files are somewhat of infinite size. We don't, we don't know how big a file is going to be, right? So we, we are pretty much preparing ourselves to have to chop up most of our files into smaller pieces to fit them into individual clusters in memory. We just want to pick a reasonable cluster size so that we can efficiently use our hard drive space. So we can store a lot of stuff on our hard drive. All right, that makes some sense. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, I am 
not going to give you any new homework. Um, I know the last assignment was a little bit of a backbreaker. Um, do start thinking through this uh, file system thing. We'll start thinking about implementing it on uh, Monday and um, uh, kind of think through kind of the data structures we might need for this type of thing. And hopefully what you uh, start stumbling upon is that the same thought process you, that you put into your homework that was due this week is the same thing we have to put into this. We're just changing up what our page size is, what our cluster size is, and we're thinking about what kinds of things we're gonna be putting in there. But now we're actually gonna be dividing up our files. You know, we're going to be taking in an amount of file size, let's say, and say, okay, we have a, you know, a, a, an 8K file or a 12K file, and I need to split this up into a bunch of 4K buckets. And I need to put it somewhere, and I need to keep track of where I put it. Because depending on the current state of my hard drive, I might not be able to put those buckets right next to each other. I might have to store four of the K somewhere for the next 4K somewhere else in my hard drive and the next 4K somewhere else in my hard drive. And they're scattered all over the place and I have to keep track of that somewhere and that's in the file allocation table. Or the new thing that we invent that's sort of kind of like a file allocation table, okay? So I suppose if I, I'm not gonna grade it or anything, but if you wanted to take some time to kind of get yourself caught up, um, look at the wiki for the Wikipedia page for the file allocation table. Look through this, get an idea on how this, uh, how this works. Make sense? Okay, but I'm not quizzing you over it or anything like that. Uh, we got enough stress going on in our lives. So let's uh, um, catch up on this. And then on Monday, we'll uh, start talking about our ghetto implementation of our version of a file system. Sound good? Questions, comments, concerns, bribes? And hopefully I'm all the way better uh, by then. I'll be back to my uh, mean self. All right, that's all I have for you. Get lost. <laughs> Do you uh, have time I after have this? Time. Oh, sorry. Oh, I have time, but I have time in general. I don't know if I have time for you. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, because like I just want to like summarize up like what I have um, learned so far just to make sure that I understand the concept. All right. right. Do you want me to keep recording so it's at the end of the recording? I mean, it's up to you, but it's just like. You. I don't care. It's, it's, it's me clicking a button. That way you can go and review it later. So ask, ask your question. Sure. So then. Um, so then during the lecture, I see you doing like two to the 30, uh, like two to the 30 second times like 4096. I don't get where did you get the 4096 from? That's four kilobytes. Oh, but like. So 4096. Like how, like how can you decide if it's like four kilobytes or like eight kilobytes? Is that just like depends on you? It depends on me. Yeah, that's a decision we make. But we were using the example that in a uh, uh, FAT uh, 32, they used four kilobytes, or FAT 16, I think. It was four kilobytes cluster sizes. So four kilobytes divided by 1,024, that's bytes. Four, um, I'm sorry, times. So this is bytes. Divide by a thousand four is kilobytes. Oh, hang on. So then, so then, why is it four bytes? Sorry, I cannot hear you. What did you say? You gotta put your headphones back on. You got the TV running in the background. Yeah, yeah. I have you on the background. It's just that it's just cracked right at the moment you talk. So four kilobytes times 1,024 gets me bytes. That's what 30 is. There are 1,024 okay. kilobytes. Uh, there are 1,024 bytes in one kilobyte. If I have a 4K cluster size, and I want to know what that is in bytes, I have to multiply it by 1,024. 
Yeah, so then why would you multiply it by 2 to the 32? Well, 2 to the 32, if it's a 32 bit, uh, that's the number of how high we can count. Ah, 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 okay. The second is the number of unique things. And if we multiply that by 4K, that's the total size of memory we could have. Okay, so then basically you're saying that we have 17. That's gigabytes, that's terabytes. So if I use 4K uh, cluster sizes and I use 32-bit counting. Oh, that means we can have... I can have 16 terabytes of total hard drive space that I can work with. So then you can have an access to 16 terabytes, is that what you're saying? Yep. Okay, so for example, if you say like one cluster, that would be like, if you give it a four kilobyte, that will be a cluster is four kilobyte. Correct. Okay. And the number so, of clusters I have is two to the 30 second. Two to the 30 second. That's, okay. that's the number okay. of clusters I can have. And then the, okay. that times the size of my clusters with the amount of storage I can have. Okay, so then, um, what am I about to ask? Um, so then, for example, if you have like something that 12 kilobyte, so you will divide that into like three buckets of, yeah, three buckets of four kilobyte, correct? Three buckets of four kilobyte. If you have like an object of like 12 kilobyte, then you would oh, divide yeah, that into. You would divide it into four, to three clusters. Oh, three clusters. Okay. So then like. You said that we need to have, um, like we, so like you said that we need to have like some type of like management to, um, like to do the, um, like to manage these things like on top of this. So like, what does that mean? Because you say like there's a partition divided across. I heard of that. I just like. I just don't really get well, it. Oh, right. So in situations where we have a larger physical hard drive, see, it's not that common anymore for us to have multiple partitions unless we have a reason for it. But historically, if we had a hard drive that could store, so here, using this example right here, let's say I had a 20 terabyte hard drive. What is partition, by the way? It's a division like what does it mean? of a hard drive. So here, let's okay. use this as an example. If I went out and I purchased a 20 terabyte hard drive, okay. I could not use FAT32 to, for, to, to manage that entire hard drive. Okay. It could only work with 16 terabytes of the 20. So I okay. would need to have a 16 terabyte partition if I wanted to fully take advantage of one of the partitions. And then I can have a second four terabyte partition each of them being managed by their own version of FAT32. So then you would divide uh, 20 terabyte into 10 and 10? Well, you could do 10 and 10, or you can do 16 oh. and 4. Just oh, okay. the maximum size of one would have to be 16 if you planned on managing it with FAT32. I have a question then. So you said, you told me that FAT32 is like 4, is like the number that you give FAT32, or is it? FAT32 is actually only holding four kilobytes. Uh, that's, well, fat, a version of FAT32 uses 4K clusters. Why is it using 4K? That's, that's the decision they made, the people who- Oh, okay, okay. But for even larger file systems, there is a version of FAT32 that can use eight or 16K clusters to give you a, to address even larger uh, uh, hard drives with the understanding that you might have bigger files on average where 4K is, is not being as efficient as something larger. But if we think about just the default FAT32 and we think about it as a 4K cluster size, um, Whoever invented FAT32 made that decision, just like when we invent ours, we'll make that decision. But they said it's 4K. So that then tells us the story that if it's a 32-bit file allocation table, we can count to 2 to the 32nd. And if the, if the cluster size is 4K, we multiply those things together and we get 16 terabytes of maximum memory that we can work with. Okay. Can you have like a, like a black page? 
like because like I would just wonder like how would the hard drive connect to the soft? Like I can just use like the drawing tool that we have on the thing, but you want me to do this? Yeah. Give me a minute. Um, let me see if I can draw on this. So like for example, if I have like like um 12 kilobytes so that means like three cluster like this on the hard drive right yep so then for example if i want to like if i want to access it to like from ram so like systems like system drive so what that means i'm storing like three memory address from this uh no no at this point if you you wouldn't access it from memory you would have the file system would be asked to load the file into memory. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to pull the file together first, then re-divide the file up in such a way that it's compatible with memory. So memory follows a different set of rules. So it uses, let's call it four byte pages. So we're using 4K clusters in hard drive. We might go to four byte pages in memory. So now we need to take our 12K file and divide it up into a whole bunch of, what will it be? Um, so 12 times 1,024 gets us bytes divided by four, 3,072 individual pages and load those into memory, probably right next to each other. So this would be contiguous memory. Um, and we would return the base address of where that lived in contiguous memory. So would that, would that also equal to 3,000, like 3,072 memory address total? Well, it would be one memory address that would be the base address of where that file started in memory. And then we need 3,072 continuous memory after that, correct? Correct. To act as bucket zero, bucket one, bucket two, in four byte chunks of that file. Oh, I see. And then like the and then like the CPU will only give like the base address of where the thing at. Is this how they call it? Yeah. So we'll get the base address of where bucket zero lives. And then if you needed to get if you wanted to go to byte uh, two hundred or four byte two hundred, so I guess I guess byte eight hundred, you would go to uh, you would say the base address plus um, uh, eight hundred. Which would take you to the a place in memory where the 800 byte was off the base address of that file. Okay. So it's nothing new. It's the same thing we talked about before with the address. Okay. Sure. Just curious. Like I, I listened to the lecture. I would just want to make sure that I understand it right before I move on to anything else. Thank you. Also, can you stop the recording? I have a couple of questions to ask. All right, hold on.